Good afternoon for those of you in, in London and uh, around uh, the world, in fact. My name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm uh, one of the directors of the LSE Ideas, which is a foreign policy think tank based here at the LSE. Uh, today, we're going to uh, be hosting Dr. Ahmed Shinak, uh, who will s speak to us on, the quest on cyber policy uh, in the Middle East. Um, he is uh, uh, what he is presenting on will fit into our larger digital IR program, which is a project that, that examines the consequences, concerns, and the relationship between the emerging digital technology uh, and, and that world with uh, the international relations theoretical underpinnings of, of our particular discipline. So, um, as you know, cyber. Uh, issues are of considerable concern in, in uh, around the world, and in particular, uh, one one area of particular focus is in the Middle East. What what our, our speaker today will address will be uh, how cyber conflicts, cyber weapons, and the forging of, of policy and politics in the Middle East uh, affect. Uh, and play out in the region. So we'll focus on origins and trends. If I can just uh, introduce him more formally, um, Dr. Shinak is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, the, Fen uh, the Fenderman School of Public Policy and Government, and a research fellow at Hebrew University's Cyber Security Research Center. Um, the Davis Institute for International Relations and the Truman Institute for Advancements of Peace. He's served and worked in the cybersecurity sector with the Israeli Minist uh, Ministry of Defense and has, holds a political science degree, uh, uh, sorry, an MA and a PhD in political science from Hebrew Univers University, as well as the Har uh, done postdoc work at Harvard University. Lots of other things he's done. I'm sure he can speak to those. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amit uh, Shinak, over to you. Hi, and I want to start by um, thanking uh, LCIDs for um, inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to you all. Um, so, um, so yeah, th thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, and I am at the Hebrew University at the time. Um, my research in general, and, and I'll try to show that in my presentation, um, focus on the intersection between emerging and disruptive technologies, or mainly cybersecurity, but also others, and the uh, forging of security policy. Um, I am researching also the effect, uh, the dual effect between uh, interstate and intrastate relationships and this uh, situation and also other political and social contexts. Um, my, um, so uh, some of the work that I do also is re regarding processes of innovation and I'll try to address that uh, during the talk. Um, what I'll do today is start with some context and basic assumptions, which I think are very needed when talking about the uh, Middle East and cybersecurity. I will later try to do something which is, I don't know, an attempt to present a kind of a menu of potential uh, issues, important issues, according to the way I see it, in regards to cybersecurity and uh, the political situation, the political status in the Middle East. Um, I will give a few examples for each of course, of many more, and hopefully this will give you some kind of a balanced uh, picture in a way. Um, which is supposed to uh, be an opening for uh, more research, more talk, more conversation. Each of these topics can hold, you know, uh, um, you know, a whole uh, presentation by itself, if not more. But I thought that trying to give the big picture here, uh, touching only on the glimpse of things, is, is important. Uh, the first element, the first important basic assumption is that uh, the Middle East is definitely on the map in terms of cybersecurity. Um, according to one of the main researches that was done about cybersecurity uh, by Valeriano and Manis, who were looking on all um, the known cyber attacks, cyber conflicts until 2014, one of the main uh, you know, conclusion is that there's an overlap between where there is an existing uh, conflict 
a political conflict interstate or between states in the world and also cyber conflict. Cyber conflict does not just exist by themselves. They tend to overlap and hence the Middle East, as you can see in this map, which is provided by the National Security Archive, is very much existent there just, but the general world map of cyber conflict, you, if, if you look at it, you will see many states and other organizations which are active there. Um, in a way, uh, they have a much uh, bigger role in cyber security than uh, other areas of the world. So it's definitely something that should be investigated. Um, um, cyber is also, I mean, countries in the Middle East are also victims of cyber attacks. Um, as you can see in one of the latest uh, uh, um, overviews, um, it is also a place in which a lot of attacks occur. A lot of the you know, states in the, in the Middle East are victims of cyber attacks, whether they are also are um, initiating cyber attacks by themselves, but they also they very much um, uh, feel or, or experience cyber as something that affects their perception of security, and hence it necessitates you know, the creation of policy you know, the initiation, the creation of institutions and so forth. Um, one of the major things that I'll try to show today is the overlap between the pre or the existing um, social and political, you know, context and, and, and tensions in the Middle East and cyber attacks. Uh, just a few pictures here can show you that every, the many of the things that happens anyhow uh, overlaps with cybersecurity. It was uh, stated by one of the main researchers about uh, what is one of the main issues in cybersecurity, which is the attribution problem. The fact that uh, it's almost impossible to fully 100% attribute a cyber attack to an entity, to a state, that it's always a political choice. It is always a political choice in the cyber world to uh, decide to say, to, to announce that a cyber attack uh, was, uh, was done by a, an, a certain entity, by a state or by an organization. And hence, this is a political story, and that's the kind of story that I will try to present. Um, something to say about the research, which is about uh, cybersecurity. Um, it is definitely um, not there enough. There's a growing uh, amount of research, researchers that are working on the intersection of Middle East in cybersecurity, but uh, there's a lot to be done yet. Um, some of the special um, issues that, that happens in the Middle East, like the, the power of sub-states, uh, ent uh, you know, entities, like, you know, terrorist organizations and others, um, it's, 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 it's one of those things that are not really investigated well in, 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 among um, cyber researchers. There's also a lack of the study of cyber from the local perspective, you know, nobody hardly reads uh, whatever is written in Arabic, in Farsi, in Turkish, in Hebrew, and maybe a bit more, but not not enough about how cybersecurity, cyber issues affect you know the perception of security in those states and the creation of uh, cyber policies. In a way, we tend or among this growing field of research of cybersecurity, there's a tendency to rely on a Western uh, kind of like approach in which we measure the effect of cyber in the Middle East and how it affects um, the, you know, the Western world and not how it affects actually in the Middle East. Um, a slide here shows one of the famous uh, examples for that, which is was uh, a simple attack <coughs> that was done by the Syrian electronic army a pretty small um, um, cyber arm of, um, of Syria. <coughs> Sorry. The attack wasn't really uh, serious. They were hacking Twitter and saying that there was um, an explosion in the White House. This was uh, very fast uh, presented as a false or fake news, but the effect at the time of 2013 on the stock market was very big. And that's an example of how a very minor event in terms of the history of cyber in the Middle East was uh, treated as a very a pretty big event in the West or in the United States. <coughs> Sorry again. Okay, this is the menu of what I'll try to present today. I'll try to discuss a few things like how uh, cyber is an issue of the relationship between the Middle East and great powers great important countries in the world, 
how it's part of local regime stability of um of the of cyber power as it's in translated into innovation and the ability to um to have a successful ecosystem for innovative um cyber tools how regional dynamics uh, whether aspiration for um hegemony or, or anything else um can be can be seen also uh, expressed in cyber conflict and also the relationship between uh, uh, states and um, subsidy actors. I'll start with how great power are um, are seen in the Middle East in terms of cyber security. First of all, um, cyber is not just an issue of attacks and conflict. It's also based on you know the basic ability to advance infrastructure, IT infrastructure, um, and the Middle East is definitely part of a bigger picture, part of a bigger game, a bigger competition technological competition between the leading uh, powers of the world, um, both in the United States and China, um, talking about the 5G, for example, the new generation for um, um, the IT uh, infrastructure, um, the growing competition between um, 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 the ability of China to provide 5G cheap and very good and well uh, and efficient 5G infrastructure by their companies like Huawei and ZTE and also counter uh, actions like uh, the Clean Network Initiative by the United States. The Middle East is part of that, convincing states uh, today in the world, but also in the Middle East, um, to either um, re refrain from uh, allowing um, Huawei or China to provide them with a cyber security, or not cyber, with a, with a, with a 5D, uh, 5G infrastructure, or, um, or to adopt that uh, Chinese technology is really, um, in a way, it's, it's it's almost symbolizing as if you're choosing sides politically, which camp are you siding with? And the Middle East is definitely a part of this a big game. Um, also, as the Middle East, always in history, just strategically located between Europe and, and the Far East or Asia and Africa, um, it is also um, a critical place for the infrastructure of, of, uh, of um, of uh, optic fiber, whether under sea cables or, or above ground, um, and also part of the Chinese aspiration, uh, their big plan for the Belt and Road Initiative that has a digital component to it. Uh, we can see that, that the fact that uh, this have, in, in a way, um, along the years have made some states like Egypt, for example, a very important as a location for uh, undersea and, uh, and also overland um, you know, major, um, communication cables, um, and today there's new initiatives like uh, the Blue Ramen Initiative. This means that those infrastructure makes, uh, on the one side, those countries important. It's like a new, like a natural resource that can be utilized for, you know, to gain political power, but also um, it's a cause for fear and uh, it's, it's a vulnerability, um, need to be protected, and the infrastructure there holds a lot of information which is of interest. Uh, whether for intelligence uh, organizations or other reasons around the world. There are bilateral agreements between uh, different states and um, local um, Middle Eastern states that are focused on cyber. Cyber is one of the key issues today that are, uh, that are you know, discussed when you are forging security alliances. Um, um, in 2020, um, Iran and China signed a big um, you know, security pact, which included cyber uh, uh, cooperation, but uh, this that's the picture in the slide, but there are, of course, a lot of ties that are held by other countries, like Israel, for example, with the uh, United States and other countries, and it seems that those bilateral agreements, which are today also about cyber, are, a, you know, a big portion of the security relationship between Middle Eastern countries and uh, countries uh, outside of the Middle East. Um, Cyber, also Middle Eastern countries also pose a threat to um, other countries, to great powers of the leading countries in the world. Um, well, this is a quote, for example, that have you seen here from one of the main spokesmen in Iran um, from 2012 already, um, in which Iran, um, after uh, revealing she was attacked um, by cyber means, have decided to plan you know, a, a retaliation or to create the ability to retaliate or to become a cyber power. And as you can see on the slide, this is one of the latest uh, ex exposures in the United States of an attack 
um, uh, you know, allegedly was um, came from Iran against um, you know trying to meddle uh, through a cyber uh, operation with the latest uh, um, uh, United States presidential election, and just to see that you know the Middle East plays a factor when assessing threat in in uh, in regards to um, in regards to the cyber realm. It's true also, of course, to other states, not just to Iran. This is an example. Already in uh, 1998, uh, one of the first time, one of the first event that I've, was served as a wake up call in the United States was the uh, event that was called the Solar Sunrise, which was uh, when the United States uh, revealed she was attacked through the internet. Um, uh, sensitive places like the Pentagon and NASA were hacked. Um, when digging into the event, uh, first people of the Pentagon thought, you know, they were, they were attacked by Iraq at the time under the regime of Saddam Hussein. But then later they revealed this was uh, the cause of a uh, young um, um, uh, teenager from Israel that was uh, collaborating with two other American teenagers, um, uh, doing that just for the fun of it, uh, just to show how uh, sometimes um, an unintended, you know, uh, the unintended consequences of an attack. Uh, that was the first time that the Middle East came on the map of, uh, of cyber, or the beginning of cybersecurity. As you can see also, um, cyber, so in Middle Eastern countries are also uh, victims, but also the initiators, or considered to be the initiators of a lot of um, 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 cyber uh, network espionage, you know, the stealing of intellectual property um, by cyber attacks. And this is definitely a place that is both um, you know, causing problems, but also on the defense. Moving ahead, I want to talk about one of the main issues, which is, you know, um, which regards to cyber and, and in the Middle East. The fact that the Middle East is composed of a lot of states which are of more of autocratic uh, nature or not really democracies, uh, just like in other uh, places in the world, makes um, regime stability one of the main fears which is, a, which is associated with cyber. One of the main events which had, um, I think, an international importance, of course, was um, um, was the uh, uh, the Arab Spring or the Tahrir Revolution of uh, 2011. Um, at the time, um, uh, it created an image as if this was a, you know, a revolution that was based on social media as a tool to maneuver people to the street, to be able to um, you know, topple the regime or uh, create uh, instability in, uh, in the former regimes in, uh, what, in Egypt and other states. Um, even though later uh, investigation and research have shown that um, a lot of the movements a lot was actually uh, dependent on the very like traditional uh, uh, Islamic social kind of like uh, abilities to maneuver people into the street, not really based on social media, but still this was, this has caused uh, an image that social media or the internet is posing a threat to regime stability. We can see this effect um, in uh, this example here, which is how the new constitutions of states in the Middle East, like the new constitution of 2014 in Egypt have addressed this issue. Um, security of information or the sovereignty of information as a key issue that should put, that that is that is enacted into into the uh, into a constitution that gives the states a right to control um, social media. Social media as a place which should be monitored and also feared. This is true, of course, not just to uh, not just to uh, um, the Arab Spring, but also to other events, other um, events which were about um, uh, regime stability in the Middle East, whether Iran in 2009 and also lately in the fuel uh, protests, um, Syria uh, and um, you know the, the civil war. Um, and one of the main tools uh, that are being used, um, which is an internal tool, but it's still in the realm of cyber, cybersecurity is internet shutdowns, the ability of the regime to shut down the internet in order to prevent you know, the use of social media or IT in order to, um, you know, to undermine the, regi the regime's authority. And I think this is a very important issue. It's important because we tend to think of cybersecurity mainly as, you know, a cyber conflict between states, um, or, uh, you know, between Israel and Iran, between uh, countries in the Middle East and other countries in the world. 
But for most Middle Eastern states, the main issue is internal stability and how it's associated with cyber. Of course, with the need to keep having in the internet as a key to develop the economy and stuff like that. Um, this is also a tool of I mean, social media and regime stability. It's also uh, not just an internal tool, but also a tool used by states against each other. This is an example of an alleged uh, uh, attack by, by a Saudis, by a Saudi hacker, um, creating uh, false or propaganda inside the Lebanese social media, you know, meddle with the political situation in Lebanon. And um, as you can see here, by the words of uh, the chairman of uh, the Hezbollah organization, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, um, talking about, um, you know, talking about how social media is, uh, is a place for the actions of uh, electronic armies, as if this is an arena uh, manipulated um, by um, other forces that are trying to meddle, whether in Lebanon or undermining um, the Islamic revolution. Uh, and um, Hassan Asala's uh, lectures or uh, speeches are one of the main places to look for uh, in order to understand, you know, the, the, the Lebanese arena. And this social media takes a bigger and a bigger uh, space um, in his talk. When talking about cyber power, one uh, tend to think about cyber conflict, but cyber power of states is also based upon the ability of state to innovate, to, um, to be at the leading front of, uh, of the technology, the ability to uh, create new innovative cyber tools, whether for defense or offense or anything else. Um, one of the main examples is of course, uh, Israel. Um, this is uh, Israel today uh, has won, um, is, you know, 2020 received 30% uh, of all uh, venture capital that was invested in cyber in the world, 30%, um, second only to the United States. Um, it has a flourish ecosystem that connects between different needed uh, stakeholders like universities, um, investors from around the world, uh, big international corporations, local startups, local companies, and also um, the security sector and the government. Uh, this is a very, uh, in the slides here, you can see a vivid example of how Israel took steps in order to encourage the creation of this, uh, of this uh, ecosystem, understanding that um, the creation of a thriving innovation cyber ecosystem will eventually um, shift Israel to become, um, you know, um, a, a cyber power in the world. This is the picture from uh, the Be'er Sheva Cyber Park. As you can see, the uh, former uh, um, uh, Minister of uh, Defense of Israel, uh, Bugi Elon, talking about this park, which is connecting between the IDF, the Israeli military's cyber units, uh, the Bagunion uh, University, um, um, local uh, startups and firms, investors, international corporations, as an example of how you utilize this effect in order to advance a country's standing. Of course, this is not happening just inside a country. And of course, it happens in other countries as well. Um, it's also about uh, maybe the creation of a regional ecosystem between states in the Middle East. Um, you can see this uh, definitely as one of the pivotal uh, um, issues uh, between the, in the relationship between Israel and the UAE or Israel and the Gulf states, which is thriving under the Abraham Accords, um, the ability to weather commercially also in terms of security <coughs> to develop ties which are about innovation, uh, which are about cybersecurity is definitely uh, something which is on the front. The downside of it, of course, is that the Middle East, especially Israel, with the you know this growing amount of uh, cyber companies, are also um, you know creating uh, uh, you know are doing uh, are selling uh, cyber abilities to many states. Some of which use those abilities in the wrong way, um, you know, creating uh, human rights violations and stuff like that. The NSO group is a, a famous group that was exposed lately, um, and this is how the Middle East is incentivizing, in a way, the creation of um, an international I don't know, cyber arms control regime, in a sense, because um, a place which has a lot of friction, a lot of action, a lot of companies, eventually, you know, also um, 
uh, is encouraging, you know, maybe also for the better, the creation of some kind of order in regards to uh, selling cyber tools. Um, of course, uh, one of the main things is the overlap between internal uh, 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 actions in the Middle East, internal, uh, internal friction and dynamics and how they are emanating into the cyber world. I will, I will discuss just a few, but there are many more. The most famous one is, of course, uh, the overlap between um, um, the aspiration of Iran to gain uh, nuclear abilities and how um, uh, during uh, the quest of um, the Western countries, allegedly Israel and, and the United States, were um, using cyber tools in order to attack Iran, uh, some of Iran's uranium enrichment facilities um, using uh, the Stocknext uh, uh, malware uh, to what later was exposed uh, as the Olympic Games um, operation. I think the importance of this event, um, which is, is far reaching, far more, far greater than the actual action that it, the, the actual harm that it uh, inflicted upon uh, uh, Iran. The fact that it was exposed uh, in the New York Times the fact that books are written about that are really pushed ahead, pushed towards the, you know, to the focus of the world. Um, the use of, you know, cyber means as a way to, uh, you know, to advance uh, national security interests. And, and the question should be asked, why is that, is that happening mainly in the Middle East or because of issues in the Middle East? Maybe the Middle East is such a, you know, a, a, very conflictual, a place that has a lot of conflict anyway, a lot of conflict, a lot of friction. Um, you would also see a lot of conflict and friction in terms of cyber. Um, so it pushes to the greater um, international public uh, view issues of cyber security. Stocknext, when it was exposed, um, really pushed ahead the understanding among people in the world that um, states can craft cyber uh, weapons uh, cyber abilities and you know it's really part of the new game um, the new international game in a way uh, of course one of the other issues which are about the internal you know uh, Middle Eastern dynamics and, and cyber is about um, the the quest for hegemony um, mainly today between Iran and Israel there's a chain of attacks a change of actions which should be addressed in a bit uh, for both sides. What is, what is interesting is one that those actions, uh, although um, very severe, like the attack on uh, Iran's um, main ports or the attack against Israel, uh, some of Israel water facilities uh, are also uh, considered to be uh, actions that are under the threshold, <coughs> under the threshold of, of war. Hence, those tools are considered to be the kind of tools that can, you, you, you can inflict harm upon another state, um, uh, also giving you uh, the ability to, uh, of deniability um, and not causing a retaliation that would, you know, that would escalate towards a full war or a physical kinetic conflict. Um, another feature was interesting about those, those actions is that it's, it's, it's almost like it is signaling between the states um, there's a tendency to lately to um, to also have some kind of public side to the attack. For example, uh, one of the attacks uh, was uh, changing um, uh, the wording on on electronic billboards in uh, in Tehran in Iran, um, talking about um, you know trying to stir political riots in Iran, talking about uh, you know trying to say uh, Khamenei, where's our gas and stuff like that. Or, or, or messages that appeared on, on fuel, in fuel stations, uh, fuel pump screens. So it's almost like there's a need or a tendency or a will to, uh, to convey a message uh, using those attacks. Another feature of those attacks, which is interesting, is that um, those attacks are, um, are, of, are changing. And today, uh, some of the attacks, especially the last Iranian attacks, are attributed not to uh, the Iran Iranian, um, you know, military or, or, or Ministry of uh, of uh, Intelligence, but to Iranian groups, so criminal groups um, working either, you know, by themselves or as proxies. Um, um, it's also um, it seems that it's migrated towards uh, 
actions or attacks of uh, ransomware, like the last uh, ransomware attack by our Iranian uh, criminal groups that attacked one of the Israel's main hospitals, the Hillel Yafe Hospital, um, paralyzing it. Um, so it seems that it, you know, this dynamic shifted and evolved that it becomes much more elusive today, um, somewhere, somewhere between criminal activities and state sponsor activities, something that provides deniability, but also convey a message, um, a mixed picture there that is um, considered by some as an elegant way of a conflict because there's no real war, nobody's dying, not yet, or um, as a very dangerous action that might escalate uh, the entire arena towards a, towards, towards a war. Um, another big issue that is hardly uh, addressed is cyber and cyber state actors. It seems that in the Middle East, this is a very thriving issue. Um, they're very differently from other places in the world in which um, terrorist organization are, are not hardly uh, on the capacity of, uh, of um, you know, of uh, inflicting harm, uh, serious harm through cyber. Um, this is one of the examples used by Hamas. Uh, who controls the Gaza Strip against Israel, although not very technically advanced, they enjoy what is a very critical issue in the cyber world, which is social knowledge about Israelis. Um, for the fact that many Hamas people have spent a lot of time in Israeli jails, uh, they know Hebrew, they know the slang, they know how to design uh, fake apps to um, uh, to uh, you know to um, draw uh, soldiers uh, to click on the wrong uh, link and eventually to provide uh, Hamas information. This was a, a dating app, a fake dating app that was uh, created by Hamas, um, you know, in which they converse with soldiers serving on the border of the Gaza Strip. Um, in a way, this is showing really the essence of, you know, the asymmetric essence of cyber, which is not always exist. So sometimes in order to create serious malware like Stocknix, you need really national uh, resources. But this is another example how you can utilize social knowledge, which is sometimes exists among those organizations in order to, uh, um, to utilize it for, you know, in the relationship with the friction between states and sub-state actors. Um, in one of the latest uh, oh, conflict between um, Hamas in Gaza and Israel, one of the latest skirmish, um, another occurrence occurred, which is important to indicate, it was a cross-domain attack. Thus, um, Israel retaliated to a uh, cyber attack that was done by Hamas, an unsuccessful attack, by kinetically attacking with missiles the Hamas uh, cyber headquarters and also announcing that to the world. In a way, this is one of, one of the, you know, one of the late, uh, only uh, known attacks, which are across domain, in which you are using kinetic means in order to retaliate to a cyber attack, not answering cyber with cyber. And maybe here there's also a message uh, to the world in terms of norms maybe this is uh, the ability to do maybe the ability to do so uh, is also because this is um, it's not a state by a, an entity or subset entity that is controlling uh, Gaza and hence you can do that without um, you know in a way getting punished by the world um, and other examples for the utilize of social media by ter you know, terrorist organization like like Hezbollah um, utilizing the fact that open societies, whether democracies or you know other societies that have uh, thriving social media, are open to influence operations using um, um, cyber uh, attacks, and this was expressed uh, by uh, Hezbollah in many times, and there's various examples for that. Last but not least is the the, the, the case of uh, Joint Task Force Airs, which was uh, a joint task force by the United States and the UK against uh, ISIS uh, at the time. Um, another example of how um, the utilization of social media at the time, ISIS was using social media to send those horrific uh, films, creating fear, really empowering the organization um, um, in order to um, stir uh, counteraction by, by states. And eventually it was also um, a lot of uh, uh, kinetic uh, attacks are against those few operatives that were actually, um, um, you know, making this um, the ISIS uh, operation in, in the social media active. To conclude, and hopefully I was not uh, extending the time that was provided to me, um, 
the Middle East is um, a place that has a lot of friction, a lot of conflict. And therefore, it has also an overlap between those conflicts, between those issues, those security issues, to the cyber realm as well. Uh, I think there are a few main issues that, is, uh, that, are, that are affected because of that. One is the effect of uh, cyber conflicts in the Middle East on norms, whether um, through issues of critical infrastructures, as we can see today, for example, the attack on Israel water supply or the attack of, of, on Iranian ports. It seems that are pushing to the edge um, the thought of using cyber attacks in order to inflict harm on critical inf national critical infrastructure. Uh, this, this is a main issue for many states, but in other states, this is only theoretical. And here it already happened. Um, there's also um, knows that are regarding cyber terrorism or the use of cyber by proxies. Um, it makes you think whether the examples that we see in the Middle East of uh, retaliating across domain using kinetic means in order to retaliate to a cyber attack, which is done by um, um, terrorist organizations, is maybe setting a norm. This is acceptable because this is terrorist organizations are considered um, not legitimate. And also cases of information sovereignty, uh, an issue which is pushed by many autocratic regimes in the world, also very much exist inside uh, the many autocratic regimes in the Middle East um, there's a tendency to see the Middle East as a laboratory, uh, as a place that, uh, because of its you know, constant friction and conflict, really tests weapons, uh, how, they, how they get accepted, how, how they affect both in terms of um, you know, security-wise, but also socially. Um, and this is also why we have a lot of bilateral agreements between great powers of the world and local uh, uh, regimes, local Middle Eastern regimes that have cyber abilities. Um, it also it is also why uh, maybe one of the reasons why there's a thriving cyber innovation ecosystem in the Middle East, whether in the Gulf states or in Israel, also in Iran in a way, because they're using those means very uh, uh, much more than they would use it in other places. Uh, this is would be a true argument also for other weapons uh, which are not in the cyber in the physical world. Um, it seems that in terms of affecting the state themselves. There's a, a lot of effect on you know, the institutions that are being created in the you know, Middle East countries in regard to cyber or internet security. There's a growing legal framework here, whether uh, in the new constitutions post um, the Arab Spring or in just you know, um, in Israel and other places. Uh, there's a growing um, amount of military branches, intelligence uh, uh, units, and law enforcement agencies, which are in a process of force buildup in regard to cybersecurity in the Middle East, it becomes a much more prominent issue. Um, I would conclude by saying, um, this could have been a lecture also about another you know, uh, uh, security issue uh, in this Middle East, but it seems that cyber today is taking much more, much more space in the Middle East. So a lot of the pre-existing uh, uh, Presumptions about the Middle East also exist in regard to cyber. Thank you. And um, hopefully there will be some interesting questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talk and, and one that I think gives us insight. I, I particularly uh, like your comment about the idea of, of the Middle East serving as a laboratory for some of these uh, techniques, some of the weaponry, because in, if I think in the Cold War era, there was very much that at play. So this is an extension of that kind of logic to the present day. Um, I, I've, uh, while people are thinking of questions, I, I actually have four questions and I'm not going to ask four questions, but I'll, I'll ask one of them uh, with respect to asymmetrical warfare and asymmetrical positioning. Maybe warfare is not, not the, full, the full range here. You gave the example of both sub-state actors and indeed even teenagers being able to, to take actions which had impact at a state level. Um, is there, is this level of asymmetrical positioning, is this sustainable? Does the logic of great power resources and uh, uh, ultimately going to prevail so that smaller actors, which we always hear about as, being, as having a disruptive effect, 
on great power infrastructure uh, or or penetrating in uh, you know into uh, Pentagon, let's say, or these sort of places. Is that logic a temporary one that ultimately big states will be able to 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 uh, uh, meaningfully rebalance the the asymmetry there? Well, I think there's a, there was a tendency to think of cyber or using the internet as a, as a mean uh, to advance asymmetric uh, you know, warfare as a tool that will empower small power states or states that have less, uh, you know, that, are, that are not that advanced in technology. I'm not sure this is true anymore. Actually, I don't think it's true. I think there's an overlap between the different clubs I mean, if you would think about that, there's an overlap between advanced technological countries, the kind that would have nuclear abilities or the ability to utilize natural resources in order to advance a nuclear project, whether they already have weapon, nuclear weapons or they're you know, on the way there or have the ability to do so, and the ability to advance you know, uh, cyber abilities. There's almost an overlap between the clubs in a way. If the Stuxnet example is an example for something, it's the example of how much time and resources it takes to really create an advanced, sophisticated malware. This is not to say that we should not think of cyber as a space, as another social political space in which all, the, all kinds of interaction occur. Um, some of them are the kind of interaction which are about also um, sub-state uh, entities, whether criminal organizations, different proxies, or terrorist organization, they're also active there as well. The way I see it, it seems that they have the power to utilize cyber in a different way, whether it's uh, utilizing uh, you know, economical incentives like a ransom that overlaps with national uh, 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 interests. Okay, you don't really know. Uh, is your hospital be being attacked because of a national interest of another country or is it attacked solely for, you know, to pay money, uh, the ransom? And this really gives, uh, you know, those 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 entities. Uh, it empowers them to serve as tools, who, you know, who encourage or give the deniability, uh, give deniability to states, or they're utilizing the kind of tactic knowledge, like you know, social knowledge, that in the example of Hamas, um, that really gives them the ability to use even, I would say, low-tech cyber attacks with fake apps and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually they can be very effective. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, the Israeli authorities at the time um, um, trying to um, you know, um, encourage people to um, rush to shelter when there's a missile attack also created a, a national app that you can download to your cell phone and it will give you all the alerts in the right time. Hamas at the time very easily uh, created a fake app, which was a bit the same and also published it. So what happened was a mistrust of citizens in the, in the application, not knowing did they downloaded the real app or the wrong one, will it give them you know, real indication of a missile attack or not. So this is a great example, again, of how, how sometimes you can use um, easy and low, uh, you know, very uh, cheap tools to create a cyber effect, but on the other hand, does not dismiss that the big, things are happening by states that have a very advanced technological power. Thank you, That's very, very interesting. Uh, we have a question, um, <clears throat> I'll read out to you. How well are Western countries aware of the need to follow cyber, cyber security and cyber warfare developments in the Middle East? Which sectors of government recognize this and which don't or which do not? And this is uh, Ewan Grant, London, former UK law enforcement analyst. Thanks for the question. Great questions. Um, I've opened by talking about research, uh, the lack of needed and needed research in this field. And I think this is really, really attached to this question. Um, I think there's a tendency always in Western countries uh, to see the Middle East through Western eyes. Uh, well, they fail that in many different realms, also in regards to the cyber realm. I don't think there's enough, there's enough understanding in both investigation to the effect of cyber um, weapons and cyber abilities, cyber defense and offense, um, or this 
you know, sense of insecurity, cyber insecurity that is in the Middle East, how it affects um, this, you know, those, you know, Middle Eastern regimes, policies, and their intentions. Um, not enough was investigated uh, in that regard. This also it demands, it necessitates to read things in Arabic, in Farsi, in Turkish, in Hebrew, and that's hard for many states, also for their intelligence community sometimes, uh, where they have, they have limited resources and they don't put it on that direction. They tend mostly to assess um, the Middle East in, uh, in regard to cyber when, you know, you study in the metrics, study in cyber attacks, study in, you know, um, this kind of more of like a technical information and then I'll look at the social and political impact. So I think this is very much needed. And uh, hopefully academic research, which is starting there today, will start to fill in the gap. Great, thanks. I, I will um, pose one of my uh, qu quite a specific questions and then, then uh, I see others coming up. Um, the, the NSO you mentioned, I, I think I'm right in saying that Facebook has launched a lawsuit against that. Um, and I'm wondering, is there Israeli legislation which is also at play here that would restrict uh, companies such as that selling uh, security-based things to foreign, I don't know, either foreign governments or, or individual use or misuse of this? I'm just wondering what the legal position is. Um, I, first of all, I'll say, yeah, I think, um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lawsuit in California against NSO um, uh, by Facebook, which is the owner of, um, of WhatsApp, which was one of the, apparently one of the main apps that was used as a, you know, a vulnerability in, in, in that in application was used as a mean to, um, you know, to use uh, NSO uh, Pegasus uh, cyber tool. Um, and there are actually more lawsuits coming over by, by Apple and by many others. Um, and so in a way became a symbol of today of the need to create regulation that will restrict or would limit or would direct or you know, um, give borders to the emerging uh, uh, market of uh, cyber uh, ser offensive cyber services or different kinds. Um, first, it should say that most cyber companies are defensive. You know, they provide defensive abilities, whether that's active defense or passive defense, it doesn't matter. In Israel, there is actually um, um, uh, legislation which is about um, um, arms control in general. Um, from 2007, uh, that legislation is um, with accordance with the Wassenaar Agreement, uh, the agreement uh, between states um, that is dealing with dual use of uh, technology, um, how it can be, should be um, uh, limited and controlled, so it's not going to be used for uh, the purpose of inflicting harm. Um, but this is a very much in a, in a growing or an emerging field. Um, internationally, there's not really a clear regulation yet. Uh, the United States has just published a regulation just lately, last month, also due to the NSO uh, incident there. So I think we're on the verge of seeing this field growing and uh, with more concrete understanding. Uh, it seems that in this case, uh, NSO and the Middle East have served as an incentive to the creation of some kind of an international regime or the beginning of that. And this had happened before in other fields of different arms like a cluster and ammunition and stuff like that. Also, um, we've seen advance in the international law, which occurred because of real occurrences in the Middle East. So this is maybe another example of that. Another example, I suppose, or a variant on the laboratory, Middle East as laboratory, in this case, in terms of norms of conduct on this. Um, I've got, um, got a question now. How, in your opinion, would countries go about implementing cyber strategy? Um, how have Middle East countries gone about doing so? And is there a sort of roadmap as to the, the kinds of things they, they should do first and then things that should flow from that? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, it seems that every that many states today have, um, you know, uh, have published even, you know, their, their cyber strategies. I mean, they they also have a cyber strategy that's internal, but also they also publish them, publish them in English. Uh, this is part of um, contributing to the standing as a cyber power. It's definitely something which is it's there. It also it, it also happens in the Middle East. I mean, it's um, 
Israel just published um, in English uh, their side of strategy, their international side of strategy. Of course, uh, it was published before in Hebrew as an internal document. Um, in other states in the Middle East, which are less uh, uh, you know, communicative, or there is a growing um, um, process of forging cyber policy, even though they're not published into the world. Um, I think this is one of those elements that should be investigated. Uh, maybe with the ability to read in local languages, uh, we could really reveal more and more uh, our cyber strategies of, of countries in, in the Middle East, understanding well, uh, more than before, how did they actually, how did they, you know, how did cyber affect, you know, that their, in, you know, general cyber, uh, not security policy. Um, I would say though that there's late, that soon there will be uh, coming out a book uh, written by uh, James Shire, which is a, uh, a former, uh, I think, um, um, Oxford uh, uh, scholar who uh, who is covering this field and is uh, mainly dealing with cyber strategies in uh, the Gulf, Gulf states, which are much more advanced and etc., more communicative, more open to research. Uh, but this is definitely uh, a need, and it's definitely there's definitely things to be investigated. You had mentioned something about. Um... Uh, the technologies, you know, the high tech countries pl have it playing a particular role, states playing a particular role in cyber and cyber. I'm curious, a, a very media conscious uh, and activist country from the Middle East, the Gulf states, Qatar, to what extent do that, does that translate into an act activism in this domain, to your knowledge? Um, to my knowledge, I mean, the Gulf states are definitely one of the main places in which uh, there's a growing ecosystem for cyber innovation. Uh, in general, we can say that. The leading country there is probably the UAE, which is, uh, you know, is, uh, has already declared their will uh, um, to push, you know, to advance technology, to, to allocate resources, you know, to advance technology that will put UAE in a, in a better, you know, in a bigger or a higher uh, place in the world. Uh, it's about cyber, it's also about space uh, abilities and many others. and and. As I mentioned before, uh, this is also part of the connection today uh, under the, you know, the Abraham Accords between Israel and the UAE. I mean, you have to, you know, kind of like join hands, join, uh, you know, their ecosystem abilities uh, as a way to advance technology. Qatar, um, although a very strong in terms of media with Al Jazeera and others, um, has, to my knowledge, um, I've not publicly in a way uh, uh, addressed this issue um, as the, um, you know, as exposedly as, as the UAE and, 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 and other countries. So I haven't seen any specific, you know, initiative there, even though it makes you wonder. I mean, they're very strong as the media, but it seems that that doesn't really overlap with their, you know, creating abilities to, um, you know, to uh, conduct a cyber operation. Interesting. I uh, uh, have a question here. Um, Given the vulnerability of, of states and, and societies to cyber, this kind of cyber attacks you've been talking about, um, do, do you anticipate a reversal, a kind of decoupling from some elements of 5G as a, as a security measure? Yeah, well, first of all, there's, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's true. Thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that should be developed now under 5G, 5G, we're just in the stage of implementing the basic infrastructure, which is, can be done only by a handful of companies. Uh, for none of the Middle Eastern, none of them also uh, American, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, two Chinese companies and two uh, Scandinavian. Um, the next stage um, will be the development of abilities to um, enhance the security of communication, which will be utilized in uh, 5G. So 5G, um, is a big step, it's a big change from previous generations of uh, IT infrastructure. It's not like the jump between 3G and 4G. Uh, this will first allow the Internet of Things and many other stuff, but more of it, a lot of the management of the, of the network will be um, based on software. So less hardware, less cables and routers, more using software to control things. This means it's more manageable, but also maybe more vulnerable. And this implies a very strong need and the answers are not there yet technologically to better secure uh, 5G. It's one of the core issues for um, cyber innovation today is how to do that. And, you know, how to secure IoT, how to secure, you know, the 
the ability to um, to use um, without knowing uh, the fact that your um, security camera is connected to the internet in order to inflict harm, inflict harm on you know use it for a cyber attack uh, without nobody knowing because it's, it's a machine. Um, and this is, there are many uh, different aspects. So this is definitely an issue that should be explored. There's no answers yet, but you just uh, pinpoint uh, to the right direction. This is a, a very growing vulnerability. And I would say this is part of why the United States have initiated the Clean Network Initiative in a way um, saying to the world, if you use Chinese infrastructure, who knows, this vulnerability might grow. You, know, you might be more vulnerable uh, when entering this new phase of technology. By the way, I'm not saying this is true or not, because uh, I don't think there are any technical evidence for that yet. But this is part of what they're saying. That's part of the rhetoric. Um, and today, it's like we're rallying the camps around different standards, uh, whether you'll be under you know, the non-Chinese standard or the Chinese standard, will be linked to how much would people, uh, not in your country, be able to trust your infrastructure. And this has implications for economy, for um, you know R and D for many different stuff. So a follow up about uh, the the regional ecosystem. What will be the implications of this for the 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 idea which you put forward of a regional ecosystem in places like the Middle East when you have a you know such a fragmented uh, infrastructure? Well, yeah. Th thanks for that. I mean. Um, I think when saying um, original ecosystem, uh, uh, we can perceive this in different ways. We can see that as a very, you know, ideal view in which technology will enable uh, countries that until now were in friction and were, you know, had conflictual uh, interests to uh, to join hands. You know, and those, some of those views were uh, portrayed um, in the 90s when the Oslo Accords uh, took place and stuff like that. But also it might have a much more practical meaning in terms that there are the ecosystem is connecting between governments, government entities, universities, but also private entities, private entities that are for profit. And we might see more connection, you know, for profit between states. Uh, this, and this is, you know, it's much more low key, but also it should not be undermined because it has the potential uh, to be the grain for much, 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 something much more bigger than that. Um, you know, creating trust between the nations, uh, bottom up as opposed to top down. Um, so yeah, this is. It sounds great, but you know, the first, you know, in the close future, this might mean just you know, commercial connections, but eventually this might lead to much more. And you know, we should you know see. And hopefully, this will lead to that and not to other stuff. It would surely enhance the uh, the complex dependency between states in the Middle East, which might decrease. The, you know, the, the ability to, uh, to escalate towards conflict. Mm -hmm. we, we've actually come to the end, uh, abruptly to the end of the time, but, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, lots of, of very interesting things, threads of this, which we could follow up in the future. And I hope we do, will. Um, thank you very much for, for taking the time to share your thoughts on this, uh, this uh, very important topic. And, uh, uh, sort of um, giving us something to mull over for the future. Uh, best of luck and thank, thank you again, uh, Dr. Shina. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Eldon. I want to thank you personally and uh, LSD IDs for your invitation. Thank you. Our, our pleasure. Thank you. Bye.